every 20 minutes in our city, Metro Nashville police get a call about a domestic violence situation. Uh, I think that's a rather staggering fact. And, my, so. and our first guest today, Sharon Roberson, is here from the YWCA of Nashville in Middle Tennessee, the president and CEO, to talk about this very sad state of affairs in our country and in our fine city, but this is happening and it's not always physical abuse, is it? Correct, Sharon? correct, and, and the statistic is very startling. However, unfortunately, of all the things that we do wonderfully in the state of Tennessee, we do not do well when it comes to domestic violence. We are fifth in the, in the country at the rate in which men kill women, and that's very unfortunate. Uh, we are working hard to change that statistic, but it is, you know, where our state is at this point. What do you attribute that to, Sharon? I mean, we, we're so progressive in so many other areas. It's very difficult. First of all, you have to look at what is domestic violence. And domestic violence is basically, it's when there is a violence or act of violence between people who are in some sort of relationship. Often it's in the household, and that's what we usually look at, and that's really more of intimate partner violence, which is a subset of domestic violence. That's when you have two people that are in a relationship, and it really boils down to the power and control in that relationship that ends up in some form of violence. Mm -hmm. Of course, domestic violence can take several different forms. Uh, it's not only the kind that we think about, we all think about the physical form. But really the more pervasive forms are the economic and psychological forms of domestic violence, which really have long ranging effects and really, really are damaging. So it's not the obvious bruising, uh, the physical marks that are, are very obvious. So much of it is psychological. Again, getting back to what you said, control. Yes, and it's very much that power and control. We always say at the YWCA, we uh, support the largest domestic violence shelter in the state. We will soon be at 65 beds and we have a waiting list, so to speak. We mm. have people who we have to find other avenues of support for because we simply do not have enough beds. Uh, what you look at as far as domestic violence, it often starts with a relationship that actually seems very good and very positive. And then there are signs and things happen and over time it becomes this really controlling, a very power, you know, struggle relationship and that's where it ends up. I was reading there are patterns of behavior. Let's talk about what are those patterns? You said, does it usually start on a good note as you're saying? It, it doesn't correct, start out correct. where it's obviously mm -hmm. bad. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens is over time the relationship shifts. And when you have, let's say, for example, a sign you are isolated from your former mm. family and friends, that's a very negative sign. Uh, when your finances are controlled by another person, when the other person makes demeaning remarks about you and, and, and you are not as perfect as they say you should be, all of those things are signs that you're in a power and control cycle that is a form of domestic violence. Hmm. So who is really, uh, who do you see this happening to most often? It, it really crosses socioeconomic yes. groups, doesn't it? Correct. And ages. Correct, and that would really, if you could say this is the pattern or this is a kind of person, you really can't say that because there are all types of people there are professional people, there are you know, people who are non-professionals, there are young, old, rich, poor, any type of person. This could happen wherever the power and control dynamic exists, you can have domestic violence. What's usually, when do you usually get wind of it? How does the YWCA find out about it? Is it from the police department? Where, or, or is it from hospitals? It really, from a number of sources. Uh, of course, we have a 24 hour, a seven, uh, 365 day, seven days a week hotline in which individuals can call crisis line mm -hmm. and they can call to receive help. But often it starts now with the police force because the police are answering domestic violence calls constantly. And when they do have a situation that involves that intimate partner violence, let's say spouse or girlfriend, such that the person is in imminent danger of losing their lives, then we have what's called the LAP, or Lethality Assessment Program. And within that program, the police will ask the victim a series of questions to determine whether or not their particular case 
could potentially be lethal in the future. Mm -hmm. And the person can make the choice to talk to someone who is trained in how to handle their situation immediately with the police officer's support. And they can need anything from wanting just some counseling to getting a safety plan to actually coming into shelter. Often people stay in those abusive relationships. Mm -hmm. We hear about that oftentimes. Why is that? Uh, there could be a number of reasons, and all of them will make a lot of sense, and we should not be judgmental for people who stay. The reason for that is there could be e simple economic reasons. They don't have the ability to really support themselves economically, mm -hmm. and they may have to, in their viewpoint, stay in that relationship. Often it's simply because they have children and family relationships, mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to uproot your life when children are involved. It could simply be that they care for that person. You said you have 60 beds that are available. 65. 65, but a waiting list. So what do you do in the interim for those people that, that, that need the bed? Well, it, I hate to call it a waiting list because we do try to find yeah. accommodations mm -hmm. for anyone that does need shelter. And there are some other resources in the Got community. It. They are not uh, plentiful and it's very difficult, but a truly lethal situation. We try to make it work. Do you see good outcomes of people where you can intervene and get them in a shelter? Or do you have a good success story or something to share oh, like that? Oh, we have many of those, and I think that really is what keeps us working toward this goal of eliminating domestic violence and also supporting the survivors. And, you know, as you know, October is Domestic mm -hmm. Violence Awareness, and we not only, you know, bring awareness to the community of the issue of domestic violence, we also celebrate our survivors. And there are many people that come out on the other side of this and have wonderful lives. And we want everyone to understand that there is a way out of a domestic violence situation. That is a, a great way to wrap this, this segment up. But I want to ask you also, sure. for anybody watching, if you know someone, if there's someone in your family, yeah. if it's you, um, or, but in particular, if it's someone you know, what, what can you do to help somebody? What can you say? What can you do? The most important advice is you are a friend, a mother, a sister first. You are not in the position to judge. You are not in the position of telling them what they need to do. That is something that they need professional guidance on. So the first thing is to educate yourself. Have all the information about the resources in your community, including what the YWCA offers. Once you have that, you can provide them with the information. You can help them to the extent that you can provide them information and be supportive. Non-judgmental support is the most important aspect of right. what you need to do. Thank you for opening our eyes to this topic and that, to let us know there is help, Sharon. Well, thank you so much Thanks. for having me today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, and we'll, we'll be right back with a lot more after this.